I am a nurse. I am a nurse practitioner, and I'm a nurse scientist. It's through this education and experience that affords me the opportunity to understand the environment of the NICU and the clinical situations that can be improved through scientific inquiry. My research trajectory is scientific exploration in this high-tech, low-touch world. I am able to see the important questions and the clinical situations with overreaching aim to improve neonatal outcomes. Let me put into perspective the world I live in. At 25 weeks gestation, 15 weeks prior to delivery, a neonate weighs about the 20 ounces, about what a bottle of water weighs, and is 13 inches long. Their hand is about the, the size of your fingernail. My early work really explored how respiratory care can impact the skin structures of these little fragile infants. So you can see here from these pictures that my early dissertation was all around the skin structures that were being irritated and abrased from these life-saving treatments. The other component of this, however, is when I listened inside the incubator, opened the portholes, I could hear this loud wishing sound. And I realized immediately that the sounds inside this plastic box that was their home really did exceed the AAP recommendation of 45 decibels. When I started to measure the sound, I found sounds 50, 60, even 70 decibels inside these boxes that our babies live in. So to best understand, babies can hear at 25 weeks. All the auditory structures in, are present. They can hear sounds, yet they don't have the cognitive understanding of what they're listening to. The pathways that neurologically develop over time are still being created. You can see infant brain growth from 20 weeks to 35 weeks takes a great deal of time, but even the growth from 35 to 40 weeks is very impressive. So it's that cognition that occurs over the latent pregnancy that's very important for language acquisition. You can see in the fetal world the sounds of our environment from 25 to 40 weeks at term is the mom's gastric sounds, her heartbeat, the language around the baby inside uterus muffled through that protected uterine wall. And it's through that environment that the plasticity is starting to develop. We in the NICU keep everything very hushed, very quiet. We use earmuffs on the babies to keep their environment quiet. But an unforeseen circumstance is that we also limit their auditory input in this quiet environment, and that can have negative consequences. This really impacted me, and I began to look at a different pathway. My trajectory of research started to look not only from noise, but also looking at the language acquisition that preterm infants are supposed to have. This work, this new trajectory really engulfed me, and I hypothesized that the preterm infant must be supported by a quiet yet supportively rich environment full of language and sound and music. Parents and healthcare workers can support outcomes through the use of the language and positive auditory stimulus. The findings from my observation in the NICU was that we deliver very robotic care in the NICU. We approach the bedside, we don't speak to the patient, we do our care, we close the portholes and we walk away. And this, this robotic care that's mirrored to the role model behavior to the parents. So we do have a void of language in our neonatal population. In the February 2018, while I attended a grant writing workshop housed um, over at ORE, Louise Nettles mentioned to me that another researcher on campus was using one of the devices I was using to collect language outcome data. It's called Lena, and she put me in contact with Dr. Jessica Hay, who was a, a wonderful match. My expertise in the NICU and the neuroenvironmental population of, of the NICU and her expertise in language development was a perfect match. We began to write together, and we um, wrote, first of all, a grant in R15, which we're happy to say was funded. We, uh, our specific aims for that grant was to describe biophysical markers associated with infant stress in the NICU, and then look at predictors whether or not 
language outcomes could be determined by what happened in the NICU and then long, longitudinally through the home environment and then into the lab. We also, while we were waiting for our grant to be reviewed, began a feasibility pilot at the University of Tennessee Medical Center where we're looking at language outcomes and the impact of noise to these tiny babies. We're looking at vital sign reaction to bouts of language in this population. And I just started recruiting for our longitudinal study, which takes place over the first 18 months of the patient's life. So I'm collecting, as you can see here, in the NICU um, and recruiting for that study now. Following hospitalization, these babies will be followed at home and we'll be collecting language values in the home and then we'll bring them into the language lab where our current study uses speech comprehensive task and Bailey's developmental testing to see what language outcomes can be impacted through improved language acquisition. We believe that the research is critical for infants in the NICU from the time they're transferred down the hall from the delivery room. I often push these incubators down the hall um, to early and later childhood. And we have to remember that language is part of our understanding in the world we live in. It's our social connectedness and it's the way our children learn. Children success and they're the hopes and dreams of every parent I care for in the NICU. Our team is committed to future work which will support improved language outcomes to both the preterm population and then we'll extrapolate that to the opioid exposed infant in a short time. Thank you.